Amen. Let me give you a little bit of humor. Azalia, Azalia, birthday today, right? I know, I know. I went to the back and I gave her a hug, so I could not forget about Azalia. She's one of, the, of our youth and uh, we love her and she's part of our family and we're grateful. Amen, amen. I didn't want to forget about that. Let me give you a little bit of humor. Mothers teach us about foresight when they tell you, make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident. Only a, it was not humorous, was it? Okay. Mothers teach us about logic when they tell you, if you fall out of that tree and break your neck, don't come crying to me. Mothers teach us about maturity when they tell you, eat your vegetables or you'll never grow up. Some of these are familiar to me. Mothers teach us about religion when they tell us you better pray that comes out of that carpet. Mothers teach us about time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. Well, a chancla, right? Any, anybody know the, the, the flying chancla? That's amazing. Mothers teach us about contradictions when they tell us, shut your mouth and eat your dinner. How, how can you do that? I don't know. Mothers teach us about contortionism when they tell you, would you look at the dirt on the back of your neck? That's a difficult one. Mother teach us about genetics when they tell you you're just like your father. I've, I've heard that one more than once in my life. Mothers teach us about the weather when they tell you it looks like a tornado swept through your room. And last, I will not bore you with more. I'm horrible at humor. I'm, it's not my thing. Mothers teach us about the circle of life when they tell you, I brought you into this world and I can definitely take you out of it. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. When God made Adam, the first thing that God said that wasn't good wasn't sin. The first thing that God said that wasn't good was to men to be alone. God didn't say sin. God said the very first thing that God said, it is not good for men to be alone. And God made Adam from one of the ribs of, or God made Eve rather, from one of the ribs of Adam. And he placed Adam next, he placed Eve next to Adam so they could be a beautiful couple and start a family. And in Genesis 3.20, it says, Adam named his wife, Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. Now, Eve, the, in, in Hebrew, the name Eve means life or living, okay? I'm not going to go, I'm, I'm not, I don't speak Hebrew, so I'm not even going to try to butcher the Hebrew word, but it means life or it means living. Now, she was the first woman, she was the first wife, and she was the first mother in the world. She didn't have any formal training, you know, she didn't have... Uh, Toñita Barragan to help her and tell her, hey, look, this is what you're going to do with, with, with Jeanita, right? Because a lot of you have children, and you could always, I know Elizabeth with Nathan, you probably ask your mom or your mother-in-law or someone, hey, so what do I do when the kid won't stop crying in the middle of the night? Can you imagine Eve? Who did Eve turn to when she became a mom? She had no one to go. She was the first mother, no formal training. She didn't go to school to become a mom, just like you didn't go to school to become a mom. So she had it very tough trying to become a good mother. But we know that the Bible tells us that there was a, a, a horrible story that happened in, in the beginning. She had two children. One of them was Cain and the other one was Abel. And most of us know the story that there was an issue with envy and there was sin that got into the world and Cain ended up taking the life of his brother Abel. And it was a sad story. It's a tragic story. Pastor was telling us that he was in a, in a funeral yesterday, and the mother was in the first row being witness to her son's funeral. I think it's, it's the most devastating thing to see one of your children pass away, especially if you're a mother. But can you imagine not only losing one son, but losing two of them? And you would say, how is that so? Because yes, Abel's life was taken away by Cain, but then Cain was taken away and he left the side of his parents. He had to leave his mother. So there is where we see the story and it reads in Genesis 5, 4 and says, 
and Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. And while we look at this story, it is interesting for us to realize that sin can have tragic consequences in the life of a family. A mother is a mother that will make a difference is one that realizes how critical it is to maintain a spiritual balance, a moral balance, an emotional balance in the life of her family. Let us read what Genesis 4, 25 and 26 says. Adam made love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says that when Seth was 105 years old, he fathered Enosh. And Enosh is, became what it is known now as the godly line of Seth, of whom we have Abraham as one of his descendants. Now, the interesting highlight that I want to make this morning is, if you look at the last sentence in that passage, it says, at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. People, we need to understand, people of God, that it is imperative that we call on the name of the Lord when we are going through a struggle in our life. You cannot resort to your own understanding of life. You cannot resort to your own wisdom. And especially, you cannot resort to what the world tells you on how to deal with your struggle. We need to call on the name of the Lord. What happens is here. When the mother has a child, you have that baby and you, t you bring him home. And, and I know it's different between child number one and child number four. Completely different. If you have more than one or two children, you know that it is completely different when you have your firstborn and you have pictures for every little thing that happens in their life. With child number two, it changes a little bit. Three, and then four, you have no pictures. Okay? <laughs> Miguelito, I'm sorry. Okay? But this is what happens. I mean, this is how, this is how parenting it becomes. But, what, but this is the important thing. When you have a child, that child is like, an, is like a vessel. It's like a, like a clean canvas that you can begin to, to put into it. You be, can begin to paint a life, and you can, do, you can use two brushes. You can use the brush of the Word of God, or you can use the brush of what the world tells you to do with your children. Moms that make a difference do the three things we're going to talk about this morning in this sermon. They protect, they support, and they instruct. Moms, what your children need the most, and I don't, listen, and I don't care if your child is five years old or if he is 27 years old. Your children, moms, they need your protection, they need your support, and they need your instruction. It doesn't matter if they're 50 years old. I wish my mom was still with me because I can guarantee you I'm a married man and I'm going to be, at, this is in November is going to be our 30 year anniversary. Can you believe that? Yes, yes. I got married when I was 12 years old. <laughs> no, I wasn't. Well, yeah, that was 10. That would be so, so bad. That's horrible. Sorry, that's not funny. It's not meant to be funny. Sorry. No, no, we were, we were adults. But even with, at, my, at my age, I would love to be able to converse with my mom and ask her, Mom, I need your help. Because she made a difference in my life. Let's look at the first mom that made a difference. And we're going to talk about the protective mother, Jochebed. Let's read Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Le Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, he wasn't only fine physically. In other translations, it says that he was a beautiful child. 
Moses was born with a certain angel on his, on his face. I don't know if they translate the same in, in, in English. Uh, in Spanish, when you have a beautiful aura about you, you say, tienes un ángel, right? What that means really is that you have a special glow about you. This was Moses. He was a fine child. And she hid him for three months. What mother, what mother in the right mind, having a beautiful baby, would hide her child for three months? That is beyond me. But let's read so we can understand why this is happening. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. What is happening in this passage is this. The first two chapters of the book of Exodus give us a perspective of what is happening with the children of Israel in the land of Egypt. The narrative of this book tells us the struggles and the toiling that the people of God had in the land that wasn't their own, that they were brought upon because of a famine that happened way back when, 400 years ago. The nation of Israel is now in Egypt, and the glory days they endured and the prosperity that they endured now was being opposed by a new Pharaoh who didn't like the children of God. And being a Hebrew in that day was a liability. And we understand what, how, how can I say this nicely without getting all political? The life of migrants is not easy. And I'm not going to get into political. I don't want to know where you stand. That is your own prerogative. But I do need to discuss that the, being a migrant me being someone who came from a different country, seeking a better way of life, it is difficult. When you're in a place and you don't speak the language, when you, when you don't look like everyone looks, it is a struggle. It is difficult. And that is exactly what the people of Israel were facing. They were, they were living in a hostile environment because the Pharaoh in this place decided that he, no, he felt he felt threatened by the people of God. Sentía amenazado. Why do you say that, Pastor? Read your outline, Exodus 1, 15 and 16. The king of Egypt, Pharaoh, said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, Kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. This was the reason. You, I, I don't know if you knew, but this was the reason why when Jochebed saw Moses, she hit him for three months. The, the mass murder of children was happening in the land of Egypt. Oh, there's a message behind the message when, with what I just said. There was a mass murder of children in the land of Egypt. The life of babies is precious. The, the life of babies inside the womb or outside the womb is precious before the eyes of God. And on that, and on that one, I'm going to stand firm on the rock. On that one, I will not compromise, and I will not, not take a stand. The life of children is precious, inside the womb or outside the womb, because God is the giver of life. That, will, that I will be clear as day all day long, and I will take that to the bank. This Pharaoh wanted to eliminate the people of God. Exodus 1.17, let's continue because this story gets really interesting. The midwives, however, the midwives, the midwives were Egyptian. They were under the authority of the Pharaoh. They were on his payroll. He took care of them. The midwives, even while they were Egyptian, even while under the authority of Pharaoh, 
they feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Glory to God. Then the king of Egypt summoned them, the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw it into the Nile, but every girl live. You have two options, mothers, to listen to what the world is telling us or to do what God wants you to do. It is in the midst of this hostile environment that Jochebed rises up as a godly mother to protect her son. It is, mom, you want to make a difference, you need to protect your children. And, and, and I'm not saying to put a blanket around them. I'm not saying to... to, to isolate them from the world. There's a protection that you can do in so many ways, just like this woman did. She protected her son, and it's in your outlines, the way he, she protected physically. You protect your women, moms, protect their children physically. I mean, look at when the mother, I, I, my children, they were all breastfed, and I remember my wife taking, taking the babies and just holding them right here, I mean, have you ever, mothers, you picked up the baby, maybe now it's your grandchildren, and you pick up little Victoria, which is crying, and you just hold her right here. There's a physical protection that moms can bring that, that w w when I did that, my, my kids would continue crying. I remember Isaac, he was being your own. <laughs> like no other, he would just cry here. And what I would do, I mean, I wanted to hug him, right? But, but I said to Mayela, Mayela, here you go. He's it's, it's your son right there. Because there's, there's this physical protection that moms bring that feels different. I think the body temperatures, there's something different about, their, about a mom's protection. Men, as much as we want to, we can't do that. It's their gift. God gave mothers that ability to protect physically their children. Also, mothers protect, they protect us morally. I, uh, my mom, mijo, ni lo pienses. Right? Moms protect their children morally. What, what do you mean by morally, Pastor? Mothers that make a difference will tell their children, this is good and this is bad. Simple as that. M moms, moms, you need to take a stand. I I'm encouraging you. In a, I, I need to speak the truth in love. Take a stand. Y you say, Pastor, my children don't listen to me. They listen. You may not see it now, but they can definitely, I can guarantee you, your children are listening. They want you to protect them morally. Mothers also protect emotionally, right? I know how many times, I, I, I'm a guy, I, I'm a man, but I when, when there was something emotionally that I needed to deal with, I went to my mom because there was something, there was a connection that I had with Tonita that she understood me. And I had a, I had a, a father that was an amazing man of God. I respect my father incredibly. But when it came to my emotions, I connected better with my mom. Is that weird? No, right? No, okay, good. Okay, 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 okay. Listen to what this doctor said. Mothers... When I read this, I, I thought, you know what? This makes sense. Mothers are the emotional backbones of the family. They provide a holding place for everyone's feelings and do their best to keep us from being hurt. Do you connect with that? Moms protect you. When I, because I, you know me, I am in your face. In some, I, that's, this, I, I, I've lost my filters as I'm getting older. I, I, I look at the little icon on, on the, you know, the little shrug your shoulders. I, it, and when I want to come like this and, and, and 
against one of my children when I say, I need to correct, you know what Mayela says? Relax. Go back, turn around. She doesn't do that, okay? But, but she, she doesn't go like that, right? But she goes, wait, cool down, turn around, and then go talk to Jason, right? Because, and, and I'm not, I'm just using your names, kids, be, as an example. You know, I know you guys are perfect, okay? <laughs> no. Because she's concerned about the emotional protection, and she protects our children from me. Does that make sense, man? Sometimes we men are too harsh. And, and sometimes we need to be. I'm not saying that you should not be a man. Men, you need to be men. We need to be men. But listen to the wives, because sometimes they're trying to protect your children, our children, emotionally. And mothers also protect. They protect us spiritually. And I... I can tell you that more than on one occasion, my mother was the voice of God speaking to me. And in more than one occasion, Lily, you are going to be the voice of God speaking to your son. Mama, you want to make a difference, understand that God will use you as his voice to, to spiritually protect your children. Don't underestimate the ability of the Holy Spirit to inspire you to speak to Stephen, to speak to Marco, to speak to Nathan. Moms, we need you to make a difference by protecting us physically, emotionally, spiritually, morally. The second kind of mother that we see in today's sermon is a mother who is supportive, and that is Hannah, the supportive mother, Hannah. 1 Samuel 24, 28. I'm not going to read the whole passage for the sake of time. But Hannah was a woman, and back in those days, you know, her, her husband had two wives. The one wife had children, and she was happy, and she just celebrated Mother's Day every year. She would know she had a lot of children, but on the, they didn't have Mother's Day. I was just, I'm making that up, Okay. Because you have somebody, some Bible buff, buff may say, oh, well, they didn't have Mother's Day back then. I know. Just follow along with the story, okay? So this one mom celebrated Mother's Day, and like Alex said, carne asada. He already gave it up, Maribel. You guys are having carne asada, okay? But the other mom, Hannah, could not have children. God had closed her womb, and she could not have children. So she struggled, and for years, why do you say years? Because when you read that passage, it says that year after year, she came to the temple and prayed, God, give me a child. And God heard her cry and gave her a son. But when Anna was praying, she did something that God found special about her prayer. And this is what she said, if you give me a child... I will commit that child to your service forever. I find that incredible. I, I don't know. I cannot fathom how, she, why she would make this kind of statement. Was, was her need to be a mom so intense that she did this? But God had a plan in mind. What we learned from Hannah, we're going to dive right into what the three things that we can learn. N number one, is that God answers prayer concerning children. When, moms, if you want to make a difference in the life of your children, pray for them. Pastor, I've been praying for my children for 15 years. Keep praying for them. The Bible says in the passage that year after year, Hannah prayed to God about a child. When is it going to happen? I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball that I can tell you, look, this is what is going to happen. Keep praying. Moms that are supportive, moms that really support their children, they pray for them day in, day out. Scott Hubbard says, if you follow the greatest men of God back to their beginnings, you will often find a mother kneeling to pray. I can tell you one thing, that I can aim this morning preaching the word of God and I pray that I am making a difference in your life. And the reason why is because one day there was a woman in Tijuana 
praying that God would use the life of Juan Carlitos. Your life, moms, you, you need to support your children. You may not be there physically. Maybe your child is 2,000 miles away serving in the military. Maybe your child is not here, but you can make a difference by supporting him and praying for your child. The second thing, how you can support, how mothers are supportive, is that we should give our children to the Lord to use them as he sees fit. See, we're going to leave that so you can fill in the blanks. You could pray that, you got, that, that, your, that God uses your child to become a doctor or an engineer or a wealthy businessman, right? But I can tell you one thing, that there is nothing greater and there is no greater honor than to pray that your children serve the Almighty God. And, and Pastor, does that mean that I need to pray that my child should become a pastor? No, that's not what I'm saying. But this is what I am saying. That when you pray, you pray that if your son becomes a doctor, that he, that he functions as a doctor that is a man of God. See, we, we, we got it all confused. We think that serving God is only behind the pulpit. We think that serving God is only what we do within the four walls of the church. That is way off. Because we need men, mothers, we need men and women of God out in the workplace. We need men and women of God out there in the school, in the school programs. We need men and women of God that are going to be vocal about what is happening in their life and they're contagious about the principles of the Word of God. We have a world where mothers need to make a difference by supporting their children. And that doesn't mean that they're going to do everything that their kids want them to do. It means that their mothers are going to be praying constantly for their children. It means that those moms are going to think, number one, I want my children to serve God. I love my four children. And, and if you ask me, what would you rather have, Pastor? If we'd rather have your children be really wealthy and away from God or poor but serving God, do you want to know my answer? Do you really want to know my answer? I would rather them live in a cardboard shack but be men of integrity serving God than to live in a palace and be away from God. I can guarantee you that. Oh, pastor, that is harsh. No, it isn't. Because I know that my children, my children and your children don't belong in this world. We're just passing by. Get your priorities straight. We are not of this world. Oh, you don't like me no more, do you? Like, like, <laughs> like Ledesma says, let me find something nicer. <laughs> let me find something nicer. He always says that. Oh, I love it. When she prayed... To give her child to God, we see an unselfish mother who commits what she wanted the most to whom, to him whom she loved the most. See, you will never be able to love your children the way you should love them if you don't love him more than you love your children. Does it make sense? When you love him first and foremost, you'll be able more, you will be more in tune with what with the way God wants you to love your children. It's a matter of, of priorities, church. The third way we, moms can be supportive, moms can make a difference supportive, is that we, should pour, that we should support our children in doing the Lord's will. So many moms, without knowing, they, they get in the way of God's work in the lives of her children. But being supportive, let's give me just 10 seconds. Being supportive does not mean, moms, that you give in to every whim that your children have, to every caprichito que ellos tengan. Don't give, that doesn't, the, oh, well, that's what he wants to do, that's what you want to do. Giving in, it's not being supportive. Ni un amen. Ah, oh, Señor, ayúdame. Mothers who make a difference. 
provide support by undergirding her children with the knowledge that there is a recompense, that there is a reward by doing the will of God. Moms need to children to teach their, the greatest support you can give your child is to tell your children, moms, if you really want to make a difference, to tell them, mijo, mija, when you do the will of God, there is a reward. I am serving God because I love the Lord, but I know in the back of my mind that at the end of the day, there's a reward for me waiting in heaven. My, my friends, if you don't get your reward here, I, I, let me remind you, there is a reward for you waiting in heaven. There is a crown waiting in heaven for you. Amen. I may be neglected. I may be put in second place. People may not like me here. It's okay. My reward is in heaven. Our children, moms that make a difference, tell their children, Mijo, there's a reward by doing the will of God. That's the best support that you can give to your children. The greatest support that we can do is tell them that our faith has a price. And let me wrap up this morning by telling you about the third type of mom that makes a difference. And that is the instructive mother. And I know moms love this. Mom love, moms love to tell their children what to do. Right? Right? Damaris, limpia tu cuarto. Right? Clean your room. Take out the trash. Moms love to give instruction. Can I tell you one thing? You know that God loves to give us instruction? In fact, the first five books of the Bible, okay, the first five books of the Bible are called the Torah, which literally means instruction. Because if there's something that God wants you to have, is instruction. In the book of, in the letter to Timothy, Paul is writing to his beloved spiritual son, and it tells him that by the will of God and the promise of the life of Christ Jesus, my dear son, he tells him grace, mercy, peace from God the Father, Christ Jesus our Lord. And he says, I thank God, whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. And it says, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Time is against us this morning, but when you, when you read this passage, you, you know who the Apostle Paul was, right? Bless him. He was a spiritual giant. He was a man who endured and fought, and, and he, was, he, had, he had an iron will. He was tenacious, but even himself, there were times when he felt lonely. And there was something in Timothy. I, I wish we had more time to get into all the details of what, what Timothy, how significant he was in the life of Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But Timothy had something about him. So much that he says, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Do you know someone that when you see them, your heart is filled with joy? That was Timothy to the Apostle Paul. And you say, what was it about Timothy? Let me keep reading. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, Eunice and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Timothy was half Greek and half Jewish. But he took after the religion of his mother, Eunice, and of his grandmother, Lois. And those two women were devoted in their faith. And that devotion led up to Timothy being a man whose faith was sincere and genuine which in turn made a character that he was a man of God, that when he simply came to see the Apostle Paul, Paul was filled with joy. Mom, wouldn't you like to make a difference 
in the lives of people that people would tell your son or your daughter, you are such a blessing in my life that when I see you, you feel my heart rejoice. Wouldn't that be a, an, an incredible reward if they can say that about your children, Chris? Que te digan tus hijos me llenan de gozo. That would make your day, I know that. It would make your day if your children were children that received your instruction. That's why I'm challenging you this morning, moms. Keep instructing your children. Don't stop. Keep telling them, mijo, you should do this. Mijo, this is what the word of God says. And, and you may say, Pastor, well, my children doesn't listen. I told you earlier, they do listen. These two women, their faith was in their devotion was cemented in the word of God. It was rock solid. If you have little ones, bring them to Sunday school. Bring them to Awana. In Plantalos en la obra y el reino de Dios. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I think in Spanish, so I need to translate it now. Plant them in the kingdom of God in the work of God. And when you plant them, say, God, they're here. They're yours. Plant them in CFC. Say, God, they're yours. Whatever you want to do with them, they're yours. I commit them to you. When you tell God that, he will never lose them. You may lose them at some point in your life. He will never lose them. Keep instructing your children. I'm going to ask you to please stand. Moms, protect. Moms that make a difference, support. And moms that make a difference, instruct their children. Those three things you will never, ever, ever not need in your life. Till the day we die, we will need protection, we will need support, and we will need instruction. Mothers, I pray that you would make a difference in the life of your children. And I'm going to ask all the other people, all the, all the non-moms, I don't know if that's the word, but I'm going to use it. All the non-moms, if there is a mother next to you, like Moises, I want you to put your hands on your wife because I, I want to bless all the moms. I want, I want us to bless. I, I don't want, mijo, vengase para acá con tu mamá, please. Find a mom, Marquito says, man, right there, boom, right there. Somebody, I need, I need moms to be prayed for this morning. I need, I need all moms. I need somebody. Somebody, can somebody please put your hands on Bridget, please. I know she's a mom. I know there's, hermana, you're a mom? You're a mom? Are you a mom? Can somebody please help me? Some other young child, please. I, I need all moms to feel a hand. I need somebody to have a, a hand on every mom in this place. Gandhi? Oh, yeah, right here, Mika. There's a sister right here. Perfect, perfect. All moms have somebody touching you. Say, Pastor, why? I don't want being touched. I don't like it. There's something special about the high hands that God gave my mom. I know there's something special when my mom touched my face. There's something special when Mayela's touches my face on the face of my children. Never underestimate the power of, of God's touch in your life. That's why I wanted to touch every mom. Father, thank you so much that in this beautiful chapel we meet every Sunday and we are gifted with moms that make a difference. I pray for every mom under the sound of my voice that you will give them this unyielding tenacity to keep protecting to keep supporting and to keep instructing her boys her girls father no mom is perfect but even with imperfect mothers we serve a perfect god who is always working in us and through us for the improvement of our children Father, I am grateful and I bless every mom in this auditorium. I thank you, Father, and may we have an amazing Mother's Day as we celebrate them and we thank you for their lives. 
And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Happy Mother's Day. We love you. Amen. <laughs>